John 16 verse 2, they shall excommunicate you. Yeah, the time shall come. That whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. No one in the Bible was ever persecuted for denying or affirming a multi-person God. No one in the Bible had ever proposed such an idea. It was more than three centuries after Christ that Constantine's successors were turning reality on its head by making a concerted effort to suppress people who held to the true, biblical understanding of God as one individual. Christians of all stripes had been persecuted in times prior to Constantine's conversion in 312 CE. Now persecutions were reserved for those Christians who would not walk in lockstep with the dictates of the emperors, including adherence to the new multi-person orthodoxy. But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Orthodox Christians observed Constantine's brutality, and yet went on to him as a saint. While they themselves had earlier endured great persecutions, strangely, they now became friends of the persecutors. In fact, Trinitarian so-called Christians came to persecute morally Christians, who held to the oneness of God, called the monarchies in the centuries subsequent to Constantine. In that regard, those Gentile Christians were really more the children of the emperors than of Jesus, who was non-violent John 18.36, and insisted that his disciples are to love their enemies and to pray even for those who persecute them, Matthew 5.44. Thus, with the advent of state-approved and state-enforced Christianity came centuries of false converts, who call themselves Christians persecuting true Christians whom they call monarchians. Christians were now deprived of the freedom to choose what they would believe in regard to the very God they worshipped. Free inquiry was dead. This was freedom of speech. Even to question these particular matters became a taboo, which is part of Gentile Christians who still cling to this pagan philosophy that crept in the churches and have not been driven out to this day. Sadly, many Christians even now verbally abuse and dutifully oppose anyone who trusts in Christ, but does not embrace the doctrine of the Trinity. They do so without realizing that their proclivity to harm dissenters can be traced not to Jesus, but to the dark days of Constantine and his successors. Multi-person orthodoxy was born in confusion. This same doctrine was nurtured in the bosoms of post-biblical self-proclaimed bishops, this same diabolical creed was guarded with violence by emperors and sustained by an ongoing intimidation against dissenters that continues even to this day. So that there is but little known and received in the world at this day as well as heretofore. But the universal common opinion, therefore it is that your national and traditional churches doth so sound forth their own triumphs raise heaps of authors of the first centuries as agreeing with their Catholic principles crying antiquity, church visibility, famous men are on our side. Whereas the truth of it is, all is but clamor and noise, for many of your authors are mere forgeries and lies. All is but clamor and noise, for many of your authors are mere forgeries and lies. So that there is but little known and received in the world at this day, as well as heretofore. But the universal common opinion, therefore it is, that your national and traditional churches doth so sound forth their own triumphs raise heaps of authors of the first centuries as agreeing with their Catholic principles crying antiquity, church visibility, famous men are on our side. Whereas the truth of it is, all is but clamor and noise for many of your authors are mere forgeries and lies. Hey, Matt, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Oh, great. I just kind of had a general question. Sure. I'm actually down here in Birmingham, Alabama, so it's kind of late for me. I put my baby to sleep. Um, but I was just curious to hear your thoughts on the rise of this non-Trinitarian, Unitarian theology. I feel like I, I'm almost sure. 34 years old. 
And I remember when I was in high school, this kind of started to hit a bump. But I feel like this is something that's kind of exploded, if you will, yep. over the past couple of years. Yep. And just kind of hear your thoughts on maybe why. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I actually have some, you know, close family friends um, who their children or their grandchildren have been kind of caught up in this and just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I'd be willing to do a, a dialogue with them and answer questions, but yes, I've noticed it too. Unitarians are on the rise, the oneness is on the rise, and this is part of the apostasy that's prophesied by uh, by Paul the Apostle in 2 Thessalonians 2. There's going to be the rise of the Antichrist. What they are functionally doing is, is promoting atheism. Now, they don't realize that. Now, they're going to say, no, they believe in God, and atheists deny God's existence. But Paul the Apostle makes, i got to find it, but he makes the hint that they're, they're denying the true living God. They're functionally atheists because they're not believing in the one true God who is Trinitarian. So what's happening is the devil is working well among the Unitarians and the oneness and monarchists in order to present a false God. And the false God always leads to a false gospel. And so this is what's happening. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is what's happening. And yes, I've noticed it. And I'm working hard to try and refute it. But <clears throat> it's like pushing a rock uphill because there are so many people who refuse to see. And if I could just work with them, then I could show them to themselves the inconsistency of their position. And when inconsistencies means your position is not true. But they don't want to do that. Just like Caleb could not see and refused to see the inconsistency because he's blind. You know, when I showed him, for example, uh, you know, uh, they were seeing, who were they seeing in the Old Testament? God the Father. Well, Jesus says it wasn't God the Father. He was stumped. Then he tried to come up with something. Instead of just submitting to what it says, well, it's, uh, there's seven persons. Okay? That's, that's one of the stuff we use for the Trinity. No, instead of that, he has to go in and submit the scriptures to his false doctrine. Because we could say such a person is not regenerate. The reason I say that, we could say he's not regenerate. I'm not going to say he is or isn't, but we could say such a person is not regenerate because the Holy Spirit bears witness of truth, and they're not bearing witness of truth. And Jesus is the one who sends the Spirit who bears witness of truth, and Jesus is the truth. And so what they're doing is denying the truth of who God is. So that's the spirit of the Antichrist. It, it's, the implication is they're not born again, which is why I have to tell people, you continue with this, you're damned, you're going to hell. Oh, you're so judgmental. I'm informing you. Because too many people, in my opinion, just sit there and go, well, it's a debate, discussion. But they need to know what the truth is, that their doctrines are leading themselves to damnation. They need to stop. You need to hear it. Flying men will always persecute the true sons of God. This is no different than the inquisitors, witch hunters, doctors of theology, old and modern day Pharisees who profess they know God, but in reality preach a strange God by appealing to vain philosophy. And there's a lot of that, old man. I reject your accusations totally. He's gonna give us trouble. A simple confession, priest, that's all we ask. Help us! We've got a lot of work to do in Branderston. Leave my house. The pair of I you. I told you it was going to be difficult. I reject your foul suggestions. Leave him at once. All you reject is the true God. Take him, Stern. Look for the devil's monster. You are all of you confessed idolaters. However, these proceedings shall be carried out through due process of law. What law demands, we shall satisfy. You will each be tied in a prescribed fashion and cast into the mold. Who are the Monarchians? the really dangerous opponent of the Logos Christology in the period between AD. 180 and 300 was not adoptionism, but the doctrine which saw the deity himself incarnate in Christ and conceived Christ to be God in a human body. The Father become flesh. Against this view, the great doctors of the church, Tertullian, Origen, Novation, but above all, Hippolytus had principally to fight. Its defenders were called by Tertullian Monarchiani, and not altogether correctly, Patripassiani, which afterwards became the usual names in the West. History of Dogma, Volume 3, by Adolf Harnack, Trinitarian Historian. The doctrine of the Triune God encounters heavy resistance from the majority of the faithful. Tertullian and Hippolytus did not, to all appearance, yet succeed in getting their form of doctrine approved in the churches. The god of mystery of whom they taught was viewed as an unknown god. Acts 
1723, and their Christology did not correspond to the wants of men. The Logos was indeed to be held one in essence with God, but yet he was by his being made the organ of the creation of the world, an inferior divine being, or rather at once inferior and not inferior. This conception, however, conflicted with tradition as embodied in worship, which taught men to see God himself in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, Colossians 2, 9, Philippians 2, 6, 7, quite as much as the attempt was posed by doctrinal tradition to derive the use of the name Son of God. For Christ, not from his miraculous birth, but from a decree dating before the world. Wherever the doctrine of the Logos planted itself in the third century, the question whether the divine being who appeared on earth was identical with the deity was answered in the negative. In opposition to this Gnostic view, which was first to be corrected in the fourth century, the Monarchians maintained a very ancient and valuable position in clinging to the identity of the eternal deity with the deity revealed on earth. History of Dogma, Volume 3 by Adolf Harnack. Sabinius the bishop being about 200 years after Christ and notice was contemporary with him, there was truth then in the world and a trinity of persons in one Godhead had not got footing at that time. But after religion was set up by imperial power, then bishops were chosen out of learned and philosophical men, and churches, as they called them, builded, and riches given for their support. Then were synods and councils called to establish error and formal war worship and to suppress truth. Thus was Noetus and Sabellius doctrine was judged heresy, both by Trinitarians and Arians. The Muggletonians' principles prevailing Thomas Tomkinson. This is a clear example of a Hegelian dialectic or a false dichotomy between the Arians and Trinitarians. That is to say, the Logos cultists who silenced any opposing view in order to maintain a Gnostic and philosophical view of God through repetitive propaganda. The Apostle Paul warned the churches that this heresy would creep in the assemblies in the last days before the return of Jesus Christ. Acts 20:28-31. 20, 157 million visitors, been doing radio for 20 years, written numerous books, thousands of articles, impromptu discussions all over the place with all kinds of stuff. And if you openly deny the Trinity, you openly deny the Trinity, you're not a Christian. Okay. Matt, I appreciate that introduction. That he denies a true and living God, hence he's an idolater, and he denies uh, the true and living Christ by affirming the Storianism. I'm saying this cautiously because I think we need to talk about it some more. And I don't think he's aware of what he's doing. Uh, I don't believe he's doing it intentionally. And so the problem is that he's denying the hypostatic union, even though he says he isn't, but he actually is by what, by his uh, assertions. And uh, therefore, ultimately, that leads to a denial of the, of the true sacrifice of Christ. And I can connect those dots some other time. I'm not saying he's doing that on purpose, but those are the logical ramifications of his position. Uh, he's a false teacher. He's not a true Christian. We cannot call him a brother in Christ. Here is your suppressed church history recorded by the daring few. The Arian, being but as a branch, sprouted out of the Roman Catholic, although in Constantius days, and some time after a very great branch, in so much that the Catholics could not then boast of number. For in the Council of Ariminum and Silencia, there were 560 bishops of the greatest convention that ever was known, and yet they decreed the Arian faith. So what will you Catholics say? That number is an argument of truth. Whichever of them that got the emperor on the side gained power over the other. So that both of them, although they persecuted each other with deadly hatred as they got uppermost in power, nevertheless they could agree together to kill Christ and his members. 
threatened to tread the holy city underfoot of innocent-minded men and women by their penal laws that could not bow down to their outward formalities and anti-Christian principles. These were as two thieves that truth was crucified between. Now these Catholics prevailing, and they having not only the scriptures ordered by the Emperor Constantine to be translated into their tongue, but likewise their learned counsels collected and gathered into a heap, and all of other writings of preceding bishops. Then must them books and traditional reports be viewed by the learned now made bishops. And what agreed and acquiesced with their principles were counted apostolical, and what did not agree was rejected and counted heresy, or else they translated them falsely, placing down some things of their sayings and leaving others out that made against them. And when any man was by these established bishops judged or accused for heresy, though he lived before their days, then all his books must either corrupted or burned. For they must be made to speak quite contrary to what they did in several things on purpose to make those authors the more contemptible. For it was ever so that all that are non-commissioned ministers of God and such as head and anti-church are for hiding truth from the people. As the papists do the scriptures to the end, they may keep up their fleshly honor so that there is but little known and received in the world at this day. As well as heretofore, but the universal common opinion. Therefore it is that your national and traditional churches doth so sound forth their own triumphs, raise heaps of authors of the first centuries, as agreeing with their Catholic principles, crying antiquity, church feasibility, famous men are on our side. Whereas the truth of it is, all is but clamor and noise for many of your authors are mere forgeries and lies. The Muggletonians principles prevailing 16, 95 by Thomas Tompkinson. Isaiah 44 verse 25. Majority Standard Bible, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who confounds the wise and turns their knowledge into nonsense. The Trinity is a spiritual fraud which infuses its adherents with pride, leaving them confounded and lacking love.
Mark 12, verse 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Mark 12, verse 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received a Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Listen to this men who contradict themselves in preaching one God, but with the forked tongues they preach with subtlety three gods. The eminent philosopher and theologian William Lane Craig, perhaps one of the greatest minds in the world today, certainly one of the greatest people to have ever debated the existence of God. He says this, the doctrine of the Trinity is not even apparently logically contradictory. It's not the self-contradictory doctrine that three gods are one God or that one persons are somehow three persons. Right? That would be contradiction. As regards pure logic, this does not violate any logical rule. There is no conflict in saying that God is three persons. A violation requires the same category for internal contradiction. In other words, if I said uh, God, our one God is three gods, that would be contradictory is and how he functions. If he favors community, and that after all is why he apparently created all of us, then it makes sense that he would be multiple persons. And this is exactly what we see within Christian teaching. A single God would be isolated apart from creation. Two gods would have communion, but three gods have community. But three gods have community. But three gods have have community. This is the teaching of Christianity that God has perfect unity and community within the Trinity. God, the Hebrew word here is Elohim which is actually God plural. El is God singular. Elohim is God plural. There's only one God, but there's a plurality in him because there's relationship inside God. He's multidimensional. So we read there, then God said, get this now, let us, U.S., let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Get it now. Us, our, and our. Who is God speaking to when he said, let us? Who is the us? Some of the ancient rabbis say that God was talking to the angels. No, beloved, listen to me. God is an us. God is an us. Let us make man in our image. 
We're not talking about many gods, there's only one God. But I'm saying the nature of God is us. He is relationship, He is community. He doesn't exist alone and separate from everything. Within His bosom has always been the Son. There's always been an us inside God, and He is bringing you and I into His us so that we can realize that we're never alone. We're always surrounded by us, with us. God is us, and then we're connected. Um, so he's saying, I'm just wondering if James will actually admit Tertullian said the Son was not always with the Father and against Hermogenes three. Tertullian Tertullian is dealing with a lot of different issues. Therefore, take you all your books and learning to yourselves. We have but three to read to wit. The prophets, the apostles, and the witnesses of the Spirit in these is fullness of perfection for the light and life of their words. Shining in our hearts is the rule, prop, stave, and guide of our faith, which is but one. And this one faith hath one God of a single person or substance for its object to pitch itself upon. And not a trinity of persons or substance, but Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is one single substance and no more which cannot be denied neither by scripture or sober reason. First was not the eternal Godhead Spirit, the everlasting Father. Secondly was not that glorious body, wherein God the Father did eternally dwell, the eternal Son. Thirdly, and was not that powerful word which proceeded from his Godhead Spirit through his glorious mouth, the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, by which he made the world and governeth all things. Is not this Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity more agreeable to the scripture of truth than any other trinity, to all men that acknowledge but one eternal being and no more. Now your trinity of persons will neither be made to agree with scripture, reason or sense, so that your striving to explain it doth, but the more darken the sense about your airy God, and you are quite lost in your definition, and now of late more than ever are you made a confounded babel, and your clergy clash one against another, which doth make your hearers begin to stagger. As uh, Christians, specifically as Monarchians, we affirm and believe that God the Father was incarnate. So this will be a, a presentation going through the Monarchianist position based on the scriptures and with early church history references. The Father was incarnate as a true human son. Many Trinitarian theologians and adoptionists throughout history have misapplied the term son with an assumption that it's referring to an individual who is distinct from God the Father. None of the early church believers called Monarchians by Hypolitus and Tertullian in the Apostolic Age before the First Council of Nicaea believed this doctrine. Instead, they saw a distinction of two natures, a conscious state of being or existing, belonging to the same individual, in which both natures were experienced by the same individual or same person, in a way that allowed him to simultaneously experience and exist in two distinct dimensions, namely in heaven and on earth at the exact same time. See Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 to 13, the famous Our Father prayer, where Jesus is expressing that God the Father has a will in heaven and on earth. 
See also Genesis chapter 28, verse 12 and 13, and John 1, 49 to 51. Jesus is mentioned in these passages as King of Israel, both on earth and in heaven. In the Bible, the term Father, in reference to God, is consistently talking about the Spirit who gives life and creates, but the term Son always refers to the begotten, generated, earthly or biological human existence of the same individual. God generated himself a body of flesh and blood to live inside for a specific dispensation and experience personhood through the eyes of man while sojourning for a short time here on earth. A man on earth possesses seed or life in him in order to give life or generate offspring. He becomes a father when he begets or generates a child. In the same vein, here are four important passages showing that God is a life-giving spirit and identifies the act of giving breath, life, and creating with the term father or life-giver. Jesus Christ is explicitly described by the Apostle Paul as the life-giving spirit in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45. So here are uh, four passages we will be examining and they are alluding that the term father is synonymous with the term life giver, creator, one that gives life, that gives breath. Uh, he is the one that uh, generates life, being. So he is ultimately the source. This is what the term father implies and we see it here in the scriptures hebrews chapter 12 verse 9 furthermore we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live Acts 17 verse 28 for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Genesis 2 verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Zechariah 12 verse 1, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. So we see clearly with these passages that we've just examined that the term father is showing that God gives life. God the father gives breath. And this is how we should understand the term father as it implies not only uh, in the sense of giving life, creating, but also in the covenantal sense. So it's, uh, it's synonymous. Many of the prophetic and descriptive passages about the sun are evoking God's dwelling on earth, living as a man described in the scriptures as the son of God and the son of man. So we clearly, hear, we clearly see here um, the two natures within the same person. He has a divine his pre-existing divine nature and his generated nature, namely the nature of man. So he has a human nature. Without father, born of a virgin, compare Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1 to 3 with John chapter 8 verse 56 to 59. Also compare John chapter 1 verse 48 to 51 with Genesis chapter 28 verse 12 to 13. All these passages are pointing to the pre-existence of Jesus Christ as the Lord God, the supreme ruler of heaven and earth. There is no contradiction nor controversy. 
as 1 Timothy 3.16 stipulates, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh without controversy, to be precise. Great is the mystery of godliness. So there is no controversy whatsoever in the fact that he experienced prayer, suffering, human weakness, and human emotions in the flesh as a man, and as one who submitted that same flesh to his pre-existing divine spirit that dwelt inside, overcoming sin by sinless, pure, and irreproachable life. 1 John 3 verse 1 to 3 is evidence in plain sight, uh, showing that Jesus Christ is truly God the Father incarnate. This is why 1 John 3 verse 1 to 2 is so pivotal because it clearly teaches that the world knows us not because it knew him not. You see that the direct antecedent in verse 1 is the Father. So clearly John knew that the Father became a man, that he was incarnate. He became flesh. Just as it says in John 1.10, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. By comparing these passages of scripture, we can see that it was the Father who veiled himself in the flesh and those who were not born of the Spirit but were carnal in their approach to the scriptures could not perceive this mystery. This accords precisely with Isaiah 45 verse 15, where it says, Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Saviour. The early Christians were undoubtedly monarchians. Scholars frequently refer to figures from the second century as modalists or monarchians. The term modalist was coined by Adolf Harnack in History of Dogma, Volume 3, in reference to the monarchians. So the proper term for those who hold to this view uh, as that the Father became flesh, the Father was incarnate as the Son, are to be properly referred to as monarchians and not modalists. For example, American writer Campbell Boner called Melito of Sardis theology naive modalism. This loose labeling by modern theologians like Campbell is eerily similar to Tertullian's slander in his treatise against Praxius concerning the monarchians of being simple-minded and the majority of the faithful who when presented with a hard distinction between the term father and son in relation to God would reply two or three gods are preached by the Logos party and boldly proclaim the rule of faith based on Deuteronomy 6.4, we hold to the monarchy of God or we hold to the principle of one ruler, the monarchia, as this is based on the Shema. Evidence in Petrology of the second century from, for Monarchian Christology. Reinhard Hubner, a Roman Catholic theologian specialized, specialized in Petrology, in his studies concerning the writings of Ignatius of Antioch and Melito of Sardis, asserts that Noetus antedated them and that they were drawing on his monarchian theology in his book entitled Der Paradoxe eine Antignostischer Monarchianismus im zweiten Jahre 100. The term monarchia from the Greek meaning ruling of one or the principle of one ruler and ismos meaning practice or teaching. The definition of monarchia or monarchy according to Tertullian in his treatise Adversus Praxian or Against Praxius, this is how he expresses the definition of monarchia. But if I, if I have called any knowledge of both languages, know that monarchy means nothing else but the rule of one single person. End quote. Very simple. To him, the definition of a king or a ruler, sovereign, it implies and, it, and is to be understood in its most basic form. One ruler. And here are some passages that show you clearly that there can be only one king. So 
by definition a king there is no higher authority than a king so how can we have three divine persons that are essentially one king it just defeats the argument uh, provided uh, by Tertullian himself in his definition of monarchia one ruler psalms 47 verse 7 a uh, god is the king of all the earth psalms 22 verse 27 to 29 for the kingdom is the lord's and he is the governor so third person singular pronoun used for the lord i will not be reading all the passages uh, i will only be reading the specific uh parts of the the verse the passages that i'll be providing alluding to this fact psalms 95 verse 3 for the lord is a great god and a great king above all the gods 1 samuel 12 verse 12 uh here clearly uh, we see that they asked for a human king a human king instead of god and he tells us uh, when the Lord your God was your king. Zechariah 14 verse 9, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Jesus Christ is referred to as the king, eternal, immortal, and invisible, the only wise God. That means there is no other God except jesus christ this is what 1 timothy 1 16 to 17 is implying we have uh, this sentiment echoed in 1 timothy chapter 6 verse 14 to 16 until the appearing of our lord jesus christ the second coming which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only sovereign ruler potentate means the only sovereign so you cannot serve two masters as matthew 6 verse 24 stipulates the king of kings and lord of the lords and in revelation 19 verse 15 to 16 uh, he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he is referred to as the king of kings that means above kings and lord above lords Romans 9 verse 5, uh, Jesus Christ is referred to as uh, the one who is overall God. That means the, the authority, the supreme authority above all. And I will uh, finish with this last slide in 1 Chronicles 29 verse 11. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. That's chief above all so you cannot serve two masters Many of the Church's early Christological debates took place in the context of differing views on the idea of patripassianism, that is, the idea that God the Father suffered on the cross. This view had in turn arisen in part as a response to the emerging doctrines of Jesus' divinity, and the way in which such an affirmation of his divinity could be reconciled with traditional monotheism. As Tertullian, amongst others, 
elaborated an increasingly Trinitarian theology, he was compelled to tackle the so-called monarchians, for whom the focus on the divinity of Christ was threatening to undermine the unity of the Godhead. In the words of Anglican priest and scholar Gregory Lamp, monarchianism was intended as a simple way of expressing the essential beliefs that God is one and that Christ is God, and that the subtleties of the Logos theology endangered both of these truths. And so, according to the monarchian way of comprehending God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit were more, more properly modes of God's unitary existence in his revelation, rather than distinct personalities or hypostases within the Godhead. There could be, in this monarchian view, no hypostatic distinctions in God, but only varying economical aspects of his being. Two of Tertullian's opponents, Noetus and Praxius, exemplified the arguments of the modalistic monarchians, insofar as they began with a literal interpretation of texts such as the Johannine claims of Jesus that I and the Father are one, and he who has seen me has seen the Father. For the modalists, the Son was no more nor less than a different temporal actualization of the Father. From that point, they proceeded to insist on an essential identification between Son and Father. So for Praxius, the impassable God assumes passability in the form of the suffering and crucified Son. Noetus, too, agreed that God in the form or mode of Father was impassable and immortal. Yet in the mode of the Son on earth, he became passable and mortal. As Paul Gavriljuk notes, divine passibility and impassibility were conceived as temporary properties that marked out successive modes of God's existence. Temporal succession aside, insofar as Father and Son were not different hypostases, but simply different successive existences of the one God. It could therefore be affirmed with internal consistency that the Son suffers and the Father suffers with him. But in this monarchian attempt to retain both the unity of God and the divinity of Christ, Christ was rendered little more than a theophany. While monarchianism was eventually anathematized, with Sibelius being particularly repudiated as its chief advocate. It's important to note that the concept of the suffering God was not, in fact, the primary reason for monarchianism's rejection. Certainly, the doctrine of God's immutability made it difficult to accept any sense of change in God's being, which is the inevitable concept of divine suffering. Nevertheless, it was the monarchian teaching of monadic unity by which a fully Trinitarian doctrine of God and in consequence an affirmation of the full divinity of Christ become problematized. That was the chief error of the Sabellians. As the Dominican scholar Thomas Wynandy has said, Patripassianism was therefore contemned not out of an excessive fear of ascribing suffering within the Incarnation, but out of a desire to assure that it was the Son and not the Father who became man and suffered. Brothers and sisters, this is a Caleb Percher. I will be reading a couple of excerpts from History of Dogma, Volume 3, by Adolf Harnack. As an objective historian, Adolf Harnack paints a positive picture 
in a positive light concerning the Monarchians. In this case, we understand that Adolf Harnack was the first to coin the term modalism as the ancient term for the Monarchians, which is from the Greek monarchia, which basically means the ruling of one ruler, the principle of one ruler. I will be selectively reading some excerpts that give a positive representation of the view of the Monarchians. And this is a correct representation in Adolf Harnack's words from a historic perspective, as well as the biblical teachings of the Monarchians. So just bear in mind that the term dynamic monarchians is also an invented made up term as we see this term only appeared in the late uh, 18th, 19th century. This was not a term used by the early church fathers and we do not see early church theologians like Tertullian slander his opponents like Praxius by names such as dynamic or modal monarchian. The umbrella term was monarchian. So I will be reading a couple of excerpts here. So this is the section under the modalistic monarchians in Asia Minor and in the West. Noetius, Epigonus, Cleomenus, Eschines, Praxius, Victorinus, Victor, Zephyrinus, and Sibelius, Callistus. The really dangerous opponent of the Logos Christology in the period between AD 180 and 300 was not adoptionism but the doctrine which saw the deity himself incarnate in Christ and conceived Christ to be God in a human body, the Father become flesh. Against this view, the great doctors of the church, Tertullian origin, novation, but above all, Hypolitus, had principally to fight. Its defenders were called by Tertullian Monarchiani, and not altogether correctly Patripassiani, which afterwards became the usual names in the West. In the East, they were all designated after the famous head of the school, Sabelliani, from the second half of the third century. Yet the name Patripassiani was not quite unknown there also. Hypolitus tells us in the Philosophumena that at that time the Monarchian controversy agitated the whole church, and Tertullian and Origen testified that in their day the economic trinity and the technical application of the conception of the Logos to Christ were regarded by the mass of Christians with suspicion. Modalism, as we know from the Philosophumena, was for almost a generation the official theory in Rome. It was in opposition to Gnosticism that the first effort was made to fix theologically the formulas of a naive modalism and that these were used to confront the Logos Christology in order, one, to avert deism. This is the belief in two gods, or if you will, tritheism, which was developed in 
the doctrine of the Trinity. Number two, to maintain the complete divinity of Christ. And thirdly, to prevent the attacks of Gnosticism. An attempt was also made, however, to prove modalism by exegesis, i.e. monarchianism. That is equivalent to saying that this form of doctrine which was embraced by the great majority of Christians was supported by scientific authorities from the end of the second century. The Monarchians were not only influenced by a decided interest in monotheism, a cause which they held to have been injured by their opponents, whom they called Deithiest, that is, the belief in two gods. But they fought in behalf of the complete deity of Jesus, which in their opinion could only be upheld by the doctrine, the Monarchia. In support of the latter, they appealed like the Theodosians chiefly to the Holy Scriptures, and indeed to the Catholic canon, thus they quoted Exodus 3, 6, 20, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 11, Baruch 3, 36, John 10, 30, Romans 9, 5. Even John's gospel is recognized, but this is qualified by the most important piece of information which Hippolytus has given about their exposition of the scriptures. They did not regard that book as justifying the introduction of a Logos and the bestowal on him of the title Son of God. The prologue of the gospel, as well as in general, so many passages in the book was to be understood allegorically, meaning in a way of figures of speech. The use of the category of the Logos was accordingly emphatically rejected in the theology. We do not learn any more about the Noetians here, but in the Philosophumena, Hippolytus has discussed the conception of God and has presented it as follows. They say that one and the same God was creator and father of all things, that he in his goodness appeared to be the righteous of olden times. Or do he is invisible? In other words, when he is not seen, he is invisible. But when he permits himself to be seen, he is visible. Quick footnote, see Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. He is incomprehensible when he wills not to be apprehended, comprehensible when he permits himself to be apprehended. So in the same way, he is invincible and to be overcome, unbegotten, and begotten, immortal, and mortal. Hippolytus continues, Noetia says, So far, therefore, as the Father was not made, he is appropriately called Father. But in so far as he passively submitted to be born, he is by birth the Son, not of another, but of himself. In this way, he meant to establish the monarchia and to say that he who was called father and son was one and the same, not one proceeding from the other, but he himself from himself. He is distinguished in name as father and son, according to the change of dispensations. But it is one and the same who appeared in former times and submitted to be born of the Virgin and walked as a man among men. He confessed himself on account of his birth to be the son to those who saw him, but he did not conceal the truth that he was the father from those who were able to apprehend it. Cleomenes and his party maintain that he who was nailed to the cross, who committed his spirit to himself, who died and did not die, who raised himself, 
on the third day and rested in the grave who was pierced with the lance and fastened with nails was God the Father the God and Father of all the distinction between father and son was accordingly nominal yet it was to this extent more than nominal that the one God in being born man appeared as son it was real so far from the point of view of the history of salvation in support of the identity of the manifested and the invisible these monarchians referred to the old testament theophanies with a good a right a better right than the defenders of the logos christology from page 60 same section on modalistic monarchianism we find a presentation of the doctrine of praxius the belief system which praxius held praxius was a confessor of asia minor and the first to bring the dispute as to the logos christology to rome at the same time he brought from his birthplace a resolute zeal against the new prophecy we are here again reminded of the faction of the allegai of asia minor who combined with the rejection of the logos christology an aversion from montanism also the roman presbyter caius not only did his efforts meet with no opposition in rome but praxius induced the bishop by giving him information as to the new prophets and the communities in asia to recall the litere passis which he had already sent them and to aid in expelling the paracleti if this bishop was eluterus and that is probable from eusebius writing then we have four roman bishops in succession who declared themselves in favor of the modalistic christology but it is also possible that victor was the bishop whom tertullian was thinking of and in that case eluterus had no place here it is at all events certain that when dynamistic monarchianism was prescribed by victor it was expelled not by a defender of the logos christology but in the interest of a modalistic christology the labors of praxius did not yet bring about a controversy in rome with the logos doctrine he was merely the forerunner of epigonus and cleomenes there from Rome he betook himself to Carthage and strove against the assumption of any distinction between God and Christ. But he was resisted by Tertullian, who at that time still belonged to the Catholic Church and he was silenced and even compelled to make a written recantation. With this ended the first phase of the dispute. The name Praxius does not again occur, but it was only several years afterwards that the controversy became really acute in Rome and Carthage and caused Tertullian to write his polemical work Adversus against Praxius, Contra Praxius. Of the final stages of monarchianism in Carthage in Africa, we know nothing certain. Yet see under. It is not possible from the state of our sources to give a complete and homogeneous description of the doctrine of the older monarchianism. Among the different expositions of the doctrine of the older Monarchians, that of Hippolytus in his work against Noetius, shows us it 
in its simplest form. The Monarchians were described to us as those who taught that Christ is the Father himself and that the Father was born, suffered and died. If Christ is God, then he is certainly the Father or he would not be God. If Christ accordingly truly suffered, then the God who is God alone suffered. This is just a personal footnote to this excerpt, is that with this statement of the doctrine of the Monarchians, described to us by Hypolitus, we are shown a doctrine that is not only consistent with the scriptures themselves, but we also see a logical application when we are presented the fact that Jesus is God, we are presented with the law of identity. This concept of the law of identity basically is explaining that two separate objects cannot be identical unless we're talking about aspects that is to say the second object is identical to the first object if the second object is an aspect a lesser form of the first object Modalistic monarchianism is also called Patripassianism because it held that the father suffered, and Sabellianism from Sabellius, its most famous exponent. Noetus and Praxius, who were early advocates, held that the father was born as Jesus Christ, thus becoming the son, and that he died and raised himself from the dead. Sabellius held that the father, son, and Holy Spirit are three modes or aspects of God much as the sun is bright, hot, and round. This form of monarchianism made its way to Rome at the end of the first century, and in the first quarter of the second century, it gained partial support from two bishops of Rome, Zephyrinus, who was bishop from 198 to 217, and Callistus from 217 to 222. Although he excommunicated Sibelius, Callistus gave out a statement which declared that the Father and the Son are the same and that the Spirit which became incarnate in the Virgin Mary is not different from the Father but one and the same. Hippolytus, emphasizing the role of the Logos, was accused by Callistus of believing in two gods. He would not recognize Callistus as bishop and for a time was set up by his followers as a rival bishop. Monarchianism came to Rome from the east and here and there remained in Asia Minor Syria, Libya, and Egypt for many years. <laughs> 